to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 2, verse 8. Luke 2, verse 8. just going to request that somebody back there might bump the air on just a little bit, maybe one degree cooler. And uh, if you're cold, cuddle. Just one degree. One degree make a lot of difference, don't it? They did it, yeah. One degree, one degree gets it, things boiling or cool it down. Hey, Amen. Are you comfortable? Luke 2. Just another ordinary night taking care of sheep. Just another ordinary night taking care of sheep. Just another ordinary day working. Just another day at school. Just it, This is what hits me, how life can become routine and ordinary and just almost bland, and then something happens to change your life forever. Just men out taking care of sheep. And there were shepherds living out in the fields. Everybody say living. They just weren't visiting. They were living. They made their living off the sheep. They stayed in the fields with the sheep. They took care of the sheep. Watching over their flocks at night, I read this morning of a sheepdog in Georgia that killed six or was it 11 of them? 11 coyotes. One dog killed 11 coyotes, and then he ran off. And a few days later, he came back and exposed all his wounds. He went back. To, they, they, they actually got a GoFundMe page raising money. Amen. Sister Vet in the back to raising money to help save that dog for his great, oh, he had a great Pyrenees or some bad dogs. You want, you want the mic, Charlie? <laughs> she wasn't here last week. Uh, but, yeah, I saw that, and I was just, you know, I'm a dog man, so I saw that, and I thought, man, that, that's an amazing thing. So here these men are out looking after their sheep. The night an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the angel and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The angel brought the glory with him. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior, Savior means one who delivers his people, has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes Lion in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with their angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men to whom his favor rests. When I read this, every time it hits me that one angel outran the rest of the angels. That one angel got there first, and I don't know if he was dispatched first or he was faster or he was more excited about the news, I do not know. But one angel gets there, and he says, hey, I got good news of great joy. Then the other angel showed up, and it's like that. It's like a da-da, da-da. You know, it's a, it's a, it just keeps a escalating the joy, the excitement of the moment. And again, I can tell you, if one angel scared him, you can imagine what a lot of angels did to him. I mean, they're all nervous now. And they showed up and said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. One of the worst things you can do at this season is to act like, oh, it's just this season. It's to act like, oh, I've heard this story before. Oh, I've seen that. I, I, I've seen the Christmas place. I, I've seen a Charlie Brown Christmas pastor. Want, 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 want. You know, I've gone through. But no, you've you got to bring yourself back to a place of perspective here and remind yourself this thing's about joy. Not just joy, but great joy. Amen. That the Lord of glory 
came from heaven to earth, wrapped in a manger. We'll talk about all this as this month unfolds. But to me, there's revelation on top of revelation and understanding about him coming, about Emmanuel wrapped in flesh. And the angels were excited. Amen. Let me just tell you, these angels had been with Jesus. They were in the heavens with Jesus. They knew who Jesus was. And evidently, they got hold of the plan. They, heard, they saw it. They got an email or something that told them, that God himself is going to wrap himself in flesh. He's going to squeeze himself into a little body. He's going to put himself into a womb of a virgin. He's going to come shooting out, amen, and he's going to save the world. Woo, that's something to get excited about. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Remember the shepherds. The shepherds were the low of the low of the economy class. I mean, they, they doesn't get no much lower than that. He didn't come to the palaces. He didn't come to the kings or the, or the queens, but to the shepherds. Unable, they're unable to go to the temple. They smell, they stink. They can't even go to church. I love the fact that if you can't go to church, church can get to you. Amen. And I do want folk in the house, but the bottom line, I thank God for streaming that we're able to reach out and connect with people. Unable to keep the law of cleanliness, the angel came to them first. So here, understand that Christmas is a delightful disruption of the way things normally go. It could be just another normal November, October, September. Amen. Walking through life, but then you hit December, and all of a sudden, it, it's like the brakes are starting to come on. I've got to do something prepared for this special day. By the way, December 25th is on a Sunday. I think it's a great day to have church. Amen. We will have church that day. I know many of you may have some plans, but a lot of us would like to come to church and celebrate the birth of Jesus on a day that we celebrate it. Can I get an amen? So that'll happen. So here, this disruption takes place. I mean, it's, I like delightful disruptions. I like when something takes place that just uh, makes you smile. You know, you, you, uh, uh, let me just mention something else about Pastor Joseph while I'm talking. I'm at the funeral. I'm doing the graveside, and I forget. I, I know you don't have this problem, but I forget stuff. And, I, I, and I'm trying to remember. I have three points I want to share there. And when I get there, I call out one, and I share on it. I call out two, I share on it. And the third one, I went blank. I couldn't remember. And I yelled at Joseph, Joseph, what's the third point? And he told me. He don't got my notes. He stole them a long time ago. But it was just that little disruption that made me smile. It made me appreciate it. Yesterday, David and, and, and J.J. came over. J.J. is a delightful disruption. She just said, she going to do stuff, make me laugh and smile all the time. I love when it just happens. You don't, you don't expect it. It just had a knock at the door, and next thing you got it. So here they are out at night. You know they're scared, and the angel of the Lord shows up, gives the announcement, amen, and it disrupts everything. I, I like this phrase. It, it catches the spirit of Luke chapter 2. One moment you're tending the sheep in the middle of the night. One moment you're taking care of your children. One moment you're working. The next you're being scared out of your wits by an angelic choir. I don't know how delightful that is to you, but to me that disruption is wonderful. There's a difference. The Bible uses a term here over and over joy there'd be great joy there'd be uh he's coming to bring joy to me thanksgiving was about contentment when we hit thanksgiving it was about contentment just being content amen but christmas is all about joy it's all about having joy in your life it's not about stuff as it is about joy again there's a difference in joy and happiness a lot of folk want to be happy they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to be happy happy is so external Happy is based on chance, based on circumstances. But joy is internal. It's based on choice, based on Christ. When I choose, I choose to be joyful. I choose to smile. I choose to go through life, amen, not allowing it to take me down. There are biblical words expressing joy, bright and shining, leaping and jumping, shouting and running in circles. The secret of joy, my friend, is perspective. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, what is justified? Just as if I never sinned. Now, again, I can't stop you from condemning yourself. I can't stop you from beating yourself up over your past. But I can tell you, the Word of God is not doing it. Amen. It says we've been justified by faith. 
just as if. So my faith in God tells me that my sins have been washed away. We have peace with God, and you, you're going to fight this, but you've got to get to a place where you say, okay, now, I, I, I've stopped that. I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm trusting God. And then that peace comes in. Whew. Man, in a world that is so messed up, I need peace. Amen. I need peace. Peace not just with you, but with God. Amen. When I make peace with God, I have peace with myself. Hallelujah. Through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice. There's that word, joy. Read me to do it again. It's an exciting thing about joy in the hope of glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Ow. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured his love out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. I've often said one of the signs of knowing you've been filled with the Holy Ghost is you've got love for people. I don't care if you can talk in tongues and dance a circle. I want to know do you love people. Amen. Talking in tongues, that's the derivative, sure, but to love people, to love the unlovable. Mm. Hope does not disappoint us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That scripture, I, I quote it a lot, I think it a lot, and I, I understand that, that God saw us, and he said, you know what, I'm still going to die for you. Uh, there's nothing more powerful than a redeeming love. And when you fall in love with him, it begins to affect and melt your heart. Things begin to change inside of you. I go back over my life, and I look back. It was the love of God that changed me. It was the fact that he would love me, amen, to help me forgive. I just came from Alabama. Many of you know that. I go back home, and I'm reminded of some of the hurtful, hateful things his family did to one another. And I say to myself, you know, it was the love of God that brought me out of that. That helped me love people and get through it. So joy comes from grace. Everybody say grace. Grace. The word grace, amen, is the word charis. And we get our word chara, charismatic, uh, joy. These words are related because joy comes from grace. I am forgiven, therefore I have an everlasting sustaining force in my life that keeps me through hard times. The world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it from me. Now let me tell you where joy doesn't come from. Joy don't come from circumstances. What you are going through or what is happening to you does not determine your joy. Amen. It's not your circumstance. Uh, you know, we, we think that people with joy don't have problems. Everybody got problems. Everybody I know has got a problem. And you'll see people smiling. You wonder why you're smiling so much. Did it ever hit you that some folk just got joy deep down inside? Amen. They've been forgiven. They've been rescued. Another thing, joy doesn't come from people. I don't have to have people in my life to have joy. I, you know. I don't mind being alone. Now, I love people. I like being around people. People is what I do. People is, is my J-O-B, I guess you'd say it. But what people say and do toward you does not determine your joy. You're in charge of your joy. You were in charge of it when you got up this morning. If you got a good day today, it's your fault. Nobody else's fault. And you say, well, no, I looked at social media, and it said this and this and this. Don't, stop looking at it. Stop looking at stuff that bends you and upsets you. Make, I, I, I went seasons without watching the news. Now, in, in 2020, I just about quit watching the news. I didn't want to see it. It was the same old repeat. Breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. It was the same breaking as yesterday. Amen. It never changed. I decided, you know what? I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to enjoy life. And in doing that, it changed my attitude. And listen, I know. What I'm telling you is that people don't determine my joy. But did you know a lot of people, are their joy is determined by you? They don't have this revelation. They don't have this understanding. So if you don't show joy in your life, you don't give them joy. Your kids are, are monitored. They, they watch you. They observe you. And if you're smiling, if you're going through life, you're handling suffering correctly, amen, you're dealing with disappointments all right, they see that, they pick up on that, and they, they, their whole lives are full of joy then. They, they, they shift. But if you are cantankerous, mask-wearing mean, upset over every little slight that takes place, even though it didn't have nothing to do with you, it affects your children. 
Amen. So beware of that. Position and status, where you are in life, does not determine your joy. When I was that young youth pastor preaching in that high school, I had just as much joy as I do today, pastoring two churches, amen, at 61 years of age. I want you to know there was nothing like feeling promoted and blessed and, and, and knowing that God was in charge of things, amen. So living through life had nothing to do with status. I didn't have to be senior pastor. Matter of fact, I've never used that phrase about me. I've never, I don't like using the word senior Amen. I know some of y'all get away with a cup of coffee with that, but I don't like using that word. I just, I just love what I, I get a chance to do. So the amount of wealth, economic status, the amount of wealth and resources does not determine joy. It's what you do with your wealth that determines your joy. It's the power of contentment, health, whoo, physical condition does not determine your joy. Now, yeah, it will affect your happiness. Uh, and I, this is a, a major issue in our lives as we get older. You've got to begin to take care of your body more and more. Amen. And do things that will uh, affect you for the long term. I'm just saying that in love because many of us, we thought we'd never get this old and we wore ourselves out and now we're here and now we've got to start working on it. Amen. So watch after yourself. Joy does come from understanding truth. First off, I know God's with me always. Second, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. If everyone is against me, God's still for me. He loves me unconditionally. Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we may say with confidence, God's my helper. I'll not be afraid of what man can do to me. Second thing, joy comes with peace, from, uh, peace with God. I used to go to bed at night, and I was scared, man. I was scared. I'd pray to God every night before I went to sleep from the time I was 16 till I was almost 19. God, if something happens to me tonight, please take me. I don't know how to live for you. I don't know anybody else who does. I was scared. Uh, I, it, somebody says, was, was that the fear of God? It was fear of hell. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't know anybody that knew, knew God or served God at the time. Amen. I didn't know how to live for him. And so when, when I think of that, and I, and I walk through this, and I, I read the Word of God, I, I realize that he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I have peace with God. I'm following God's plan for my life, and I'm in his presence daily. Listen, the answer for the issue for peace is just simply adjusting your life to the will of God. I got to find where the will of God is, and I got to attune my life in. I got to adjust it, and then there's peace with that. I've seen people walk through difficult times because they had peace. Amen. Peace is worth fighting for. Awareness of his presence. Hope in the future. Your future is secure because he's in charge of it. And I pray you never get to a place where you say, Pastor, I'm so tired of you talking about death and eternity and things of that nature because that's who I am. My place in your life is to prepare you for the next life. Amen. I just want you to know that I'm going, you're going, we're going. Amen. And it will be a, a glorious day when it happens. But until then, we're going to serve God here and occupy. Amen. We're going to occupy till he comes. Uh, next thing that I understand, there are things that will kill your joy. Woo! Snap that joy right out of you. Selfishness. You were born with it. You were born with selfishness. It did, you thought, I learned that from my parents. No, you were born with it. Kids get selfish. Oh, they hoard. You know, you, you, they, you start, you got to fight that thing, man. Amen. Because it, it happens in all of our lives. We, we struggle with it. We fight. James 3.16, whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at others' throats. James 4.1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. So let's go all the way to the end. The reason I ain't got what I wanted is because I didn't ask God to start with. The reason I didn't ask God to start with is it probably didn't belong to me anyway. So we started fighting and quarreling over stuff. He said, quit that. And he, listen, if God's good with it, he'll give it to you. If not, quit trying to covet other people's stuff, amen, and going after people. That, that's the wrong thing here. It takes your joy away. Resentment and bitterness steals your joy. Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one misses the grace, the care, the joy of God, amen, and that no bitter root grows up because trouble will defile many. If that happens, it begins to affect others. Bitterness. What's another thing that take away my joy? Fear. Fear take your joy away. 
Amen. Fear in the heart of man causes depression. It's the opposite of joy, depression. Amen. Proverbs 12, 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. We all have an opportunity over the next month to give kind words to people. Amen. When you do that, to cheer them up. Amen. To bless them. Put a smile on their face. All fear is built on the lie. Destroy the lie, the fear dies. Amen. I, I'm, I'm scared uh, of this, that, and the other. Can I tell you, when I jumped out of a plane, I was scared. I was scared. I was more scared going up in the plane than I was jumping out of the plane. I honestly felt like the plane was worse. It was ragged. It shook. I mean, I had friends with me. I, the neat thing about when I jumped out of a plane a few years ago, a bunch, uh, not a bunch, but uh, a parachute, is that I had friends with me. So I knew something happened to the plane. I had my wife with me, <laughs> my son with me. Amen. I was going to heaven with family. You know, so so here, uh, so it, things going up, man. I mean, it's quick, but there was a fear inside of me, and then to overcome that was the most powerful release in my life, to the point where I think, you know, I, I could do this again and again. This was not. It's the same way with uh, fear of heights, fear of elevators, fear of wh whatever goes on in your life. But when you destroy the lie, the fear dies. When you destroy the lie that you're going to hell. When you destroy the lie that God doesn't love you, when you destroy the lie that you don't matter, when you destroy the lie that you have no purpose, when you destroy the lies in your life, those fears begin to die. And when those fears die, faith comes alive. And when faith comes alive, risk takes over. And you begin to live a life that's on the edge, man. You start living and believing God for the best in your life. I'm not talking, talking about just living dangerously. That, that's not my point ever. Amen. But to live a life that says, you know what, I, I can risk it. If I, if I need to do another occupation, another job, take a chance on a relationship, whatever it is, amen, I can step out and make that happen. So if you do that, because fear makes us defensive. Fear, we, we are always quick to react rather than respond. We become defensive. Fear makes us distant. We put up walls around us and we close everyone out. Some people have fear of people, of, of being around people, and it, it keeps you away. That's why I keep fighting these in your life and my life, because I want you to connect with people. Fear uh, will, will makes us demanding. We have to be in control. It makes you a controller, amen, because controllers are full of fear. Because if they can control it, amen, then, then it doesn't have anything up over them. But I find, uh, listen, I'm going to just say it again. When they pushed me out of that plane, it wasn't, I had somebody strapped to me. I didn't go solo. I, you don't go solo first time out. And I had somebody strapped. And all I was doing was reaching back <laughs> and making sure he was still there. <laughs> amen. And sometimes in life, you've got to reach back and make sure God's still there. Amen. Because he's the one that's going to help you all the way to the ground. So let, let me start closing here. Give you some suggestions. How do I, how, Pastor, how do I bring the joy back? And if you've forgotten this, get it back in your spirit again. First, I want you to reflect on God's gifts to you. When's the last time you walked through your home and realized how good God is to you? All the things you've got in your house. It ain't what you got lost. When we went through the floods, so much of my stuff left my home, and I watched it burn. But then I saw how much stuff I still had left. Amen. The goodness of God in my life. Still had a home, still had a vehicle, still had family, still had friends. Amen. Reflect on that. Reflect on his numerous gifts to you and watch your joy increase. Psalms 103, verse 1. Praise God, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Yeah, I, if you got a a, a good job, that's great. If you got a salary, that's great. But if you got benefits, you have no idea the power in benefits. And it ain't always coming from the company. Sometimes it comes from the people you work around. Amen. Those, those connections there. Amen. Thank God for his benefits. Who forgives all my sins, heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, Amen, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. An eagle will renew its youth. It's an amazing uh, biological fact that eagles will get older in life. Their eyes will become cataract. 
They'll start losing their ability to see, and their wings will start getting uh, faltered, and they'll go and hide in the cleft of the rocks. And you walk through Scripture, you'll realize how many times the Bible shares about uh, the little, uh, uh, little rock badgers. It'll share about the ant. It'll share about eagles. It'll share about sheep. It'll share about nature. And it relates it to our lives and wolves. And, and so when he talks about the eagle, that eagle will get up in the, in the cleft of a rock. And the Scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run, not be weary. They'll walk. They'll not faint. They that wait. That waiting process is the hardest thing, saint, that you will go through in life. But the waiting is what's going to bring the joy back in your life. While that eagle waits in the cleft of that rock, he will take his head and reach it back into his feathers and begin to pull out the old feathers from his wings. He'll pull it out from his body. As he begins to pull out the, the old, gnarled, wore out wings from his body, the feathers, an oil starts producing in his skin and starts flowing. He waits, and each time he reaches back, the oil rubs across his eyes. And as it rubs across his eyes, the cataracts begin to leave. It's a powerful ointment. Amen. And it begins to anoint him again. And as, the, as he cries out, and he screeches as he pulls out the old feathers, the new ones start to grow. And again, Isaiah said, you know, I, I watched it in the clefts of the mountains. That eagle, he waited. And they that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll renew it. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. And when he comes out again, he comes out with new feathers. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and they'll not faint. Our joy often comes with waiting. It doesn't just happen because we had a Sunday morning service and, man, I wish I'd have got my more joy. No, it comes with waiting. And as I wait on him, he begins to give me strength. Sometimes we need to set aside some stuff and just give some time to God. Wait on him. Just, just wait on him and see what he does. Amen. He redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion. Look at the gifts. Eyesight, your mind. Gifts to help you in your occupation, leadership, abilities, good education. How about a soft bed, roof, food, spouse, children? All these things God gives. Grandchildren, the gifts that God gives. Second, remind yourself of God's promise regarding generosity. You know, God could have said, and whatever you do in this life, keep everything I give you. Make sure you hoard it up and save it for your family so that you, they can take it and they can hoard it up and save it for their family. God didn't say that. This is what he said. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you may abound in every good work. I want to encourage you to do something. We got midweek Tuesday night. Showed up here Tuesday night. D ran the prayer meeting. You were hunting. She did a great job. But I read this and it says, whoever sows sparingly also reaps sparingly. When you remind yourself of how good God is and the goodness of God, can I ask you to do something on Tuesday night, this Tuesday night? Tuesday night we have, it's our last midweek service, Kenny, Tuesday night. For you to show up Tuesday night and bring something. Bring something. I don't want it. I want you to give it to somebody else in the church. I want you to show up with something. Now, if you, if you don't show up with something, you're going to end up giving your wedding ring away or your watch or something. I don't want you to do that. Or your glasses. I don't want you to do that. Bring something from home. Something that you kind of like. You like it. Amen. It doesn't have to be expensive at all. It could be an ornament. Just bring an ornament. I mean, I got some Alabama ornaments. I may bring y'all. Brian, you can put it on your tree. Uh, are you using it for skeet shooting? I don't care. But, but, but the bottom line, bring something to you. Here's the thing. When I give, 
First off, I have the ability to give. God's given me the ability to give. Oh, my whole life I've had the ability to give as, as a believer. But when I give, it turns something loose inside of me that can't, I can't keep from smiling. And it ain't just to my kids, amen, or my grandkids. When I give to other people, just right out of the blue, it does something to me, amen. And when those angels showed up to the, disciple, uh, to the, the shepherds, they gave them the best news they could ever get. And then later in life, a couple of years later, the wise men showed up and gave Jesus gifts. And ever since then, we've been given gifts on Christmas Day. But where did that whole idea of giving gifts come from, Pastor? That's where it came from, that the wise men gave gifts on the day to Christ. And when they done that, when they done it, amen, it started something. And it, it, once it gets going, people get addicted to it. I, I, I love giving. I love being able to give. And, I lo and I, I'll be honest, I like receiving. Who don't like receiving? Somebody came to me this morning and said, Pastor, I got deer meat for you. Glory to God. Amen. Because I promise you, if I don't eat it, I'll give it to somebody else who will. Because that's what we do with our gifts. So I've never known anybody go bad from giving. But you heard about him. Yeah, he backslid, left God because he, he gave too much money to the church, gave too much money toward people, started blessing all the little, little communities around here and looking after folk, just gave himself to death. But I have sure seen some people get sour who refuse to let it go. Amen. So examine your heart and ask yourself, do you really believe there's a need? Am I responding based on the need? Amen. So Tuesday, I know if you're not here, you're telling me you ain't got nothing. I know some of you won't be. You'll be out of town and stuff. I know. I know. I know. But send your gift for somebody else. Okay. Amen. So Tuesday night, let's do that. Anytime, I've done this for years, man. It's been a while since I've done it. But I've, I've done it for years where we had opportunity to give away stuff. I've given watches away, motorcycles away, vehicles away. I just give stuff away. Amen. But to be able to do that. And the greatest givers I've read about through history, William Colgate, Colgate, uh, Hines, 57, amen. When, I read, when you read those names, go back and study their lives. They were tithers, they were givers, amen. Always giving, heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. Thank you for those that are watching. Help us glorify you by being generous this year. God, let us be reminded over and over that when them angels showed up and they gave that announcement that there's one born in Bethlehem, amen, in a manger, he's Emmanuel, God with us, the greatest gift ever wrapped was you. You always gave. You're such a giver. We love you and bless you on this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. I pray you have a delightful disruption this week. Just right out of the blue, something disrupts you, and it's, it's a good thing. Amen. I walked into a restaurant the other day, and I need to talk with the manager. And, and I asked the lady, I said, I need to talk to the manager. And I smiled at her, and I said, it's all good. Huh? Because a lot of times when you got to talk to a manager, I got to talk to the pastor, I got to talk to this, it's not good news. So I immediately let them know, it's all good. This ain't a bad thing. This is going to be a good thing. Amen? Hallelujah. If you need to tie their offering envelope, it's in front of you. Again, uh, scare yourself sometime when it comes to giving. Do something extravagant. Do something crazy. Believe God for the best here. Hallelujah. Man, it's been a good morning. I've reflected on a lot of stuff. Again, uh, for those that knew Bobby, her funeral will be Wednesday over in uh, Carter's in uh, North Shore at uh, 2 o'clock on Wednesday. I mention that because uh, those people gave me a chance. They gave me an opportunity, and that's, that's sometimes that's all we need. Amen? Our servant leaders will come up. As Pastor David prepares to come, I want to mention one thing. Mike Thies, Mike, uh, you guys, we're going to do this thing uh, over at uh, Bull Silas. Is that right? And uh, so this is what I'd like to see happen. If you, Bull Silas is in New Caney, and this is to support the March of Dimes. And we've done this before, but I've always looked for a project, something we as a church can, can get behind. 
and this would be a good thing to do. Why don't we bring an uh, unwrapped toy next uh, Sunday? Bring it to church. Amen. We'll put it uh, uh, in the back of the church, and then we'll deliver that on, on that Saturday. So to come next Sunday, bring an unwrapped toy. to Go to March of Dimes. Amen. And we'll deliver it on that Saturday. And I'll, I'll be a part of that at the uh, other campus. Amen. To drive stuff over and make sure they get that. But we filled a, a tractor trailer last time we done this. And, um, you know, and that wasn't just our church, but there's other churches involved. So 32 foot in close. So that, that was huge. And so each year they, they use a different group of people to, to serve and love. And then many of you have your own, but you want to be a blessing to. And uh, make sure you do that. Amen. That's what we give today. We're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and success to the kingdom. Those watching online, again, we thank you for tuning in. Go to holywild.net or go to holywild.net slash give. Amen. You can give online. We thank you for it. And you can share your YouTube uh, message of this this morning and any other time that we've been. One of the things when I was doing the funeral this week, I had people come up to me and say, we watch you online. And, uh, you know, it just hits me how many people start to connect with us over and over that I don't know anything about. So that's a blessing. Pastor Dave. Amen.